I want to welcome everyone this morning. This is Bob Nichols with Bracewell. I am a labor attorney with Bracewell. I know many of the people on the call. I've been practicing exclusively labor and employment law for over 30 years in the state of Texas. And uh, I'm joined today by Lauren West, one of our very bright labor attorneys here in our Dallas office, who I practice with for the past 10 years. Lauren and I together are going to make our presentation today. I want to cover a little bit of housekeeping. First of all, some of you may want to submit questions to us during the course of today's presentation. If you look in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you'll see a box where you can submit questions to us. If we do not have time to address them at the end of our presentation, in our 60 minutes allotted, uh, then I promise either Lauren or I will email or call you with an answer to any question posed. Also, for attorneys present, uh, I want to emphasize that this will be submitted for a CLE accreditation, and, and I'm confident we'll receive that accreditation in the state of Texas. And for those of you who want a certificate of attendance for other purposes, we're glad to provide that to you. Now, let's get uh, started. In my 30 years plus of labor and employment law for employers, I've encountered a uh, few issues that are as vexing as what we have faced with marijuana in the workplace in the last several years. And it seems that the crisis for employers about how to cope with this issue intensifies by the day. And we'll talk about that. The problem is, is how do you manage employee use of marijuana in a world where state legislatures and state voters through referendum are seeing fit more and more to provide for medical marijuana use or recreational marijuana use in an environment where marijuana remains un unlawful under federal law and for many employers in their view remains a safety concern of particular concern with positions that involve the performance of safety sensitive functions. Today, Lauren and I are gonna offer some explanation of where we stand currently under federal and state law and offer you guidance on how to try and manage these issues. Let me start with a discussion of federal law. The heightened concern about the impact of marijuana on our society in the modern era began in 1970 with President Nixon's war on drugs. Uh, the Controlled Substances Act was passed in 1970 that provided for five schedules of unlawful drugs, with Schedule One being the most severe. Schedule One being drugs that are of the greatest danger and cannot legitimately be used for any medical purpose, even under medical supervision. At the time, not knowing what to do about marijuana, the Assistant Secretary of Health suggested that for, on at least a temporary basis, it be included on Schedule One, the most severe schedule. And at the same time, the president appointed a commission, some of you may have heard of it, the Schaefer Commission, or also known as the National Commission on Marijuana and Drug Abuse, to study what, what should be done about marijuana. Governor Schaefer, governor of Pennsylvania, and his commission made up of psychiatrists and attorneys and lawmakers, studied the issue carefully until 1974. And they concluded in the end that marijuana did not represent a dire public health concern and that it should probably be decriminalized and it should be uh, and it should be dealt with through other social devices uh, like we deal with alcohol this public disapproval etc but not criminalization the nixon administration and conservatives in congress flatly rejected the suggestion that marijuana be decriminalized and in fact insisted it remain, remain on schedule one James Eastland, the very conservative senator from Mississippi at the time, chaired a subcommittee of the Judiciary Committee called the Internal Security Committee. And that committee issued a report rejecting the Schaefer Commission conclusions and stating notably, quote, if the cannabis epidemic continues to spread, we may find ourselves saddled with a large population of semi-zombies. And thereafter, marijuana remained on Schedule One, and marijuana use and possession remained a matter for which not only fines could be levied, but prison time could be served. Interestingly, in 2015, the National Highway Traffic Administration did a comprehensive study 
the most comprehensive study ever done with respect to the impact of marijuana on driving and actually concluded that marijuana only represents a minimally higher risk of, of being involved in an accident than, than in the case of sober drivers. Now, don't get me wrong. The fact is marijuana remains an intoxicant. Studies also show, for example, with driving, it has some impact on reaction time, visual function, concentration, short-term memory, and divided attention. So it does represent a form of impairment, though there is great debate, as you all know, about what level of impairment is involved, in particular relative to alcohol. In, in, in beginning in, in the late 1990s with medical marijuana in California, we've seen the spread of state laws, it we'll discuss today, providing for either medical marijuana or recreational marijuana. Uh, as states have moved rapidly and increasingly rapidly to legalize marijuana for medical and recreational pur purposes, particularly multi-state employers dealing with the laws of different states, have really struggled about how to handle marijuana in their drug policy, in their testing programs, in their discipline and discharge policies. The real key battleground is for employers, what can we do about regulating off-duty marijuana use? We know no one is saying that you have to allow employees to smoke marijuana at work, but what do you do about off-duty use? I wanna talk about state laws and, uh, and where we stand. Let's, let's look at the big picture. 33 states in, in the District of Columbia have legalized the use of marijuana for medical purposes. A variety of states that are not among those 33 have bills pending to legalize medical marijuana. 10 states now, including the District of Columbia, have legalized recreational use. Other states like New Mexico and Illinois are probably on the cusp of legalization of recreational marijuana. Yeah at least in their, the next sessions of their legislatures. Some states have decriminalized marijuana. And in fact, in response to the Schaefer Commission, a handful of states in the 1970s decriminalized marijuana use. They don't, they, they don't send people to prison or, under, or, or criminally penalize them under state law for marijuana possession, at least small amounts of, amounts of marijuana. Some states that prohibit all marijuana use still permit the use of cannabis oil or what more is commonly referred to as CBD. And Lauren's gonna to explain to you more what that means and what it involves and where we stand legally. The bottom line is under state laws, both through legislation, referenda, and case law, there is a substantial move toward employment protections for employees for off-duty medical use by when they hold a proper state medical license for the use of marijuana. Whether marijuana, uh, the, 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 there are some differences among these state laws. First of all, the big difference, as you all know, is does your state legalize marijuana for recreational purposes, medical use purposes, or both? We, we gave you a breakdown of where we stand on the numbers of states for both. Uh, the circumstances under which medical marijuana licenses may be granted varies widely. Some states, take Ohio, for example, have a very finite limited list of conditions that will authorize a doctor to, uh, to approve a medical license. There are 21 conditions in Ohio, such things as AIDS, cancer, Crohn's disease, sickle cell anemia. Then there are other states that take much broader approaches, like Missouri and Oklahoma, that basically give a doctor a free hand to decide whether a medical condition justifies the issuance of a medical marijuana license. And in states like New Jersey, Simple anxiety, and who, who on this call does not suffer from anxiety, uh, justifies a medical marijuana uh, license in the state of New Jersey. The form in which marijuana may be ingested or used varies. Like West Virginia and Louisiana only allow marijuana-infused products like pills or oils, uh, not uh, marijuana cigarettes. That's significant, by the way, in a couple of, for a couple of reasons. When some, some people think they should be allowed to smoke marijuana because the effect is more immediate uh, than it is with, for example, edibles. But some states have saw fit not to allow smoking of medical marijuana, but have allowed other forms of medical marijuana. Also, the, the form of protection for, 
employees that states provide for those states who do provide protections varies widely. Some states in their state statutes, as we'll discuss today, have non-discrimination provisions that say you cannot be discriminated against based upon your status as an employee who has a, who has a marijuana card or license under the state medical marijuana law. Other states provide that you cannot take adverse action against an employee based upon a drug test without evidence of on-the-job on impairment beyond the positive drug test results. And then there are more states, as we'll discuss today, that require you to consider reasonable accommodation of medical marijuana use, either under the state medical marijuana law itself, or like in the case of New Jersey, under the state's disability anti-discrimination law. Some other similarities among states is that no prohibitions against uh, there's no prohibitions across the board against testing for marijuana use. Well, as of this week, that is now even starting to change. Uh, the city of New York, uh, through their city council, voted overwhelmingly 41 to 5 to ban all pre-employment marijuana testing in the city of New York. And a question that Lauren and I have is, will other jurisdictions follow? We suspect, ultimately, at least some jurisdictions will follow. The argument in New York is that people should be judged based upon on-the-job impairment and not whether they use marijuana off the job. Testing, as you know, doesn't instantaneously measure impairment. It has to do with metabolites in your bloodstream and, uh, and it reflects past use, not current impairment. So we'll see if, if, first of all, we'll see if the New York initiative reach final, reaches final passage, and we'll also see if other jurisdictions follow and try and ban outright pre-employment or other marijuana uh, drug testing. Also, across the states, what we see is, I'm not aware of any state that, that permits on-duty medical marijuana use. Also, what is uniform across the states that have medical marijuana laws, is I'm not aware of any of them that permit you to be under the influence of marijuana at work. Of course, the $64,000 question is, what does under the influence mean? By the way, some states in their state laws, as we'll discuss, specifically provide that while there are employment protections, it doesn't allow an employee to be under the influence while on duty. Some states, like Minnesota, use the term impairment in lieu of under the influence. Again, there's no protections that we're aware of for off-duty use of recreational marijuana currently. Maine, at, at one point, it indicated that it, that it recognized such a, s some protection for recreational use, but then the state legislature backed off and indicated that recreational use would not be protected uh, with regard to employment. Okay, so, we have three states that ban all forms of marijuana, Idaho, Nebraska, and South Dakota. We have a series of states, 14 states, that allow some degree uh, of, of, uh, of CBD use. And that includes Texas, but as we'll discuss in Texas, it's only for intractable epilepsy, a very narrow category. And CBT, as we'll discuss, is not an intoxicant, but some people believe it has some medicinal uh, qualities of value. There are 23 states that allow for medical marijuana use only. You see the list here. It's very extensive. And finally, we have 10 states that allow for medical and recreational use. And again, that list has expanded rapidly and it will continue to expand rapidly. As I indicated, state law, there's also a series of states, as you see on the screen, that either by case law or statute have created employment protections for medical marijuana users. And those medical marijuana protections, as I said earlier, either come in the form of an anti-discrimination provision, you can't be mistreated because of your status as a cardholder, or they include reasonable accommodation obligations for mer medical marijuana users. Now I'd like to turn things to Lauren to talk about some specific cases of note in recent times uh, concerning employment protections for medical marijuana use. Thanks, Bob. The first notable case I want to talk about is Callahan v. Darlington Fabrics, a May 2017 decision from the Superior Court in Rhode Island. The facts of this case are simple. Christine Callahan was a master's student at the University of Rhode Island who used medical marijuana to treat her migraine headaches. 
She applied for and was offered a paid internship with Darlington Fabrics. Prior to submitting to a mandatory pre-employment drug screen, Callahan informed Darlington that she held a medical marijuana card in accordance with the state's medical marijuana statute. She also told the company that she currently used medical marijuana, but would not use marijuana in the workplace, nor bring it to work. Based on this information, the company informed Callahan that it was unable to hire her because she would not be able to pass the required pre-employment drug test or comply with the company's drug-free workplace policy. Callahan in turn filed suit, alleging that she had been discriminated against in violation of Rhode Island's Medical Marijuana Act and State Civil Rights Act. In the legal action that followed, Darlington argued that its actions were lawful because it did not refuse to hire Callahan due to her status as a cardholder, but rather because of her inability to pass a mandatory pre-employment drug screen. And indeed, this was a reasonable interpretation of the express language in the state's medical marijuana statute. While the statute does contain explicit employment protections, the pertinent provision states only that no employer may refuse to employ or otherwise penalize a person solely for his or her status as a cardholder. The statute also provided, however, that a cardholder shall not be, be denied any right or privilege for the medical use of marijuana. As a result, the court rejected the employer's incredulous argument, noting that the statute's language and legislative intent made it clear that employers cannot refuse to employ a person for his or her status as a cardholder and that such a right may not be denied for the medical use of marijuana. Now, the court also found support for its conclusion in a provision in the statute stating that nothing in this chapter shall be construed to require an employer to accommodate the medical use of marijuana in any workplace. According to the court, the natural conclusion of this language is that the state legislature contemplated that the statute would require employers to accommodate medical use of marijuana outside the workplace. So based on this statutory construction, and because Darlington did not contest that it had denied Callahan a known medical marijuana cardholder, employment on the basis that she could not pass a pre-employment drug screen, the court granted her motion for summary judgment on her claim that Darlington had violated Rhode Island's medical marijuana law. Notably, the court also found that Callahan had stated a claim for disability discrimination under state law. Now, the next case I want to discuss with you is Whitmire v. Walmart, which is a, 20, uh, a February 2019 decision from a federal district court in Arizona. Now, the plaintiff in this action, Carol Whitmire, worked at Walmart as a customer service supervisor. She fell and injured her wrist at work and, in accordance with company policy, was required to submit to a drug test. Contemporaneous with her drug screen, screen Whitmire disclosed that she was a licensed cardholder under Arizona's medical marijuana statute. Unsurprisingly, Whitmire failed her drug test due to the presence of marijuana metabolites. As a result, and in accordance with company policy, Walmart terminated Whitmire's employment. Whitmire sued, alleging violation of Arizona's medical, med medical marijuana act. Now, the act prohibits discrimination against lawful medical marijuana users based upon a registered patient's positive drug test for marijuana unless the patient used, possessed, or was impaired by marijuana at the workplace. Now, the act also directs that a registered patient shall not be considered to be under the influence of marijuana solely because of the presence of metabolites or components of marijuana that appear in insufficient concentration to cause impairment. Now, the court had to reconcile this language with the state's Drug Testing of Employees Act, which permits an employer to take adverse action based on a good faith belief that an employee was impaired by drugs on the job. The Drug Testing of Employees Act expressly provides that this good faith belief may be based on the positive test results for drugs in an employee system. So reading these two statutes together, the court found that an employer could rely on a good faith belief that an employee was impaired by marijuana at work where that belief is based on a drug test that establishes the presence of metabolites or components of marijuana in sufficient concentration to cause impairment. On the other hand, the court clarified that a drug test only proving recent use and not actual impairment 
cannot be relied upon to prove this good faith defense. Walmart, in this case, argued that Whitmire's positive drug screen sufficiently supported its good faith belief of impairment because the positive reading was so high. In fact, it was above what the test was capable of measuring. Walmart supported its argument with an affidavit from an HR manager stating that she understood upon reasonable belief that plaintiff's high positive test results indicated she was impaired by marijuana during her shift. However, Walmart fails to present any expert testimony regarding impairment levels and fails to present any other evidence of on-the-job impairment. The court found that proving impairment on the basis of a drug test is a scientific matter that requires expert testimony, not just the sworn testimony of an HR professional. As a result, and because Walmart fails to present any other evidence of impairment, Walmart had failed to substantiate its good faith defense and the court denied the company's mission for summary judgment. And then the court went one step further and granted summary judgment to Esponte to the employee. The court found that without any evidence that the employee used, possessed, or was impaired by marijuana at work, that Walmart had discriminated against her by terminating her solely on the basis of a positive drug screen in violation of the act. While this decision was based upon specific provisions in two Arizona state laws, it highlights the difficulty that employers may face in determining and proving on-the-job impairment to support an adverse action taken against a medical marijuana user licensed under state law. Now, these next two slides discuss a series of decisions arising out of the same set of facts. These decisions are notable for the defenses that were asserted and ultimately rejected by the court. First, the fact, SCC Niantic, Niantic denied employment to Caitlin Nofsinger, a qualifying patient under Connecticut's Palliative Use of Marijuana Act, or PUMA, on the basis of a pre-employment drug screen that was positive for marijuana. Nofsinger filed suit claiming, among other things, that the withdrawal of her job offer constituted a violation of PUMA which explicitly prohibits discrimination against qualifying patients by employers. Nofsinger 1, decided in August of 2017, arose in the context of the, com the company's motion to dismiss. The company's motion was based primarily on several federal preemption arguments and on the basis that it was generally exempt from complying with PUMA's anti-discrimination provisions. The company specifically urged that PUMA was preempted by the Federal Controlled Substances Act and the Americans with Disabilities Act. The company urged that both of these federal laws invalidated PUMA under a theory of obstacle preemption, asserting that PUMA stood as an obstacle to the accomplishment and objectives of Congress as set forth in each of these federal statutes. With little difficulty, however, the court rejected these preemption arguments. With respect to the Controlled Substances Act, the court noted that nothing in the CSA makes it illegal to employ a marijuana user, nor does the CSA purport to regulate employment practices in any manner. With respect to the ADA, the company had urged preemption because the ADA clearly declines to extend protections to persons who use illicit drugs and marijuana remains illegal under federal law. However, the court concluded that while the company may have presented a convincing case that no cause of action exist, existed under the ADA, that there was no conflict between the ADA and PUMA that would justify preemption. The court also rejected the company's exemption argument, which was based upon a statutory exception to PUMA's prohibition against discrimination where required by federal law or to obtain federal funding. The company argued that as a nursing facility, it was subject to federal regulations that require compliance with federal laws generally. The court found this argument to border on the absurd because the act of hiring a medical marijuana user does not itself constitute a violation of the CSA or any other federal, state, or local law. Now, Nofsinger 2, which was decided a year later in September of 2018 in the context of competing motions for summary judgment, further examined this exemption argument along with the scope of, of the Connecticut statute's anti-discrimination language. Now, as to the exemption argument, in these proceedings, the company specifically urged that it was exempt from PUMA's anti-discrimination provision because it is a federal contractor subject to the Drug-Free Workplace Act, 
according to the company, the Drug Free Workplace Act barred it from hiring Nofsinger. The court squarely rejected this argument. As noted by the court, the Drug Free Workplace Act requires only that federal contractors make a good faith effort to maintain a drug free workplace by taking certain measures, such as publishing a statement regarding the use of illegal drugs in the workplace. The court further observed that the Drug Free Workplace Act does not require drug testing, nor does it prohibit federal contractors from employing someone who uses illegal drugs outside of the workplace, much less an employee who uses medical marijuana outside of the workplace in accordance with the program approved by state law. Now, with respect to the law's scope, the company argued in its defense that the plain language of PUMA prohibits discrimination only on the basis of one's status as an approved medical marijuana patient, but not on account of one's use of marijuana in accordance with the PUMA program. As you'll recall, the employer in Callahan made a similar argument and failed with respect to the scope of Rhode Island's anti-discrimination provisions. The Nofsinger court similarly concluded that the explicit prohibition against discrimination based on one's status as an approved medical marijuana patient includes protection against discrimination based on use of medical marijuana pursuant to that statute, pursuant to that status. The court also found that by negative implication, language in the statute permitting an employer to restrict on-the-job use or impairment made it clear that PUMA protects qualifying patients for the medical for the use of medical marijuana outside working hours and in the absence of any influence during working hours. Ultimately, after disposing of the company's arguments, the court granted summary judgment to Nofsinger on her claim that she was unlawfully discriminated against in violation of PUMA based on the undisputed evidence that the company had rescinded her job offer due to a positive drug test for THC despite her status as a qualifying patient under PUMA. Now, while there is still relatively little case law interpreting the scope and impact of state medical marijuana laws on employment, these recent cases established several cautionary guideposts for employers. First, while much has been written by commentators about potential federal preemption of state marijuana laws, recent decisions from the courts reflect that the federal preemption argument is failing to provide a safe harbor for employers. For instance, courts in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Delaware, and New Mexico have rejected employers' arguments that the Controlled Substances Act preempts employment discrimination provisions set forth in state medical marijuana laws. Now, this trend reflects a sharp reversal from earlier decisions in which employers prevailed on this preemption argument. Notably, however, these earlier cases involved statutes lacking specific employment protection. Similarly, several courts have found have either found or opined that the Drug Free Workplace Act does not preempt state medical marijuana laws. And finally, a federal district court in Connecticut squarely rejected an employer's argument that the Americans with Disabilities Act preempted application of the anti-discrimination provisions in its state medical marijuana law. Another issue that is somewhat conceptually similar to preemption is that of statutory exemption. As discussed, most state medical marijuana statutes exempt employers from complying with the non-discrimination provisions in the event that such would cause an employer to lose federal funding, federal licensing, or violate federal law. Based on this exemption language, most employers and many commentators have assumed or at least speculated that federal contractors would be exempt from compliance with these, anti with these non-discrimination provisions. However, the case law to date has demonstrated that this may not be a safe assumption. With respect to the Drug Free Workplace Act, courts are keen in on both the narrow scope and aspirational nature of the act. As the judge in Nofsinger observed, the act requires only an employer's good faith effort to maintain a drug free workplace, and it does not actually impose any drug testing requirements on employers. Further, as to at its scope, the Act is only concerned with drug use and possession in the workplace. As such, according to several courts, it does not prohibit federal contractors from employing someone who uses illegal drugs outside of the workplace. As to other federal laws, it remains an open question as to what circumstances will actually support an exemption. Under the DOT regulations, for instance, 
it is clear that the legal use of medical marijuana under state law is not a valid explanation for a DOT-regulated employee's positive drug test. Further, DOT regulations clearly require that employers take certain actions with respect to a DOT-covered employee who tests positive for illegal drugs, including medical marijuana, and these actions include removing them from service and not returning them to a safety-sensitive position until the employee produces a negative drug test. However, nothing in the DOT regulations requires termination of an employee. As such, while an employer would not be required or permitted to simply overlook a positive drug test of a DOT-covered employee, it's unclear whether the exemption would operate to excuse the termination of such an employee. In any event, however, the DOT regulations clearly present a much stronger argument for, the applica for application of the exemption than does the Drug-Free Workplace Act. And while employers should still consider raising these preemption and exemption defenses in appropriate circumstances, particularly because other courts may consider the law differently, employers should not presume that these federal laws will trump their responsibilities to comply with state medical marijuana laws. Now, another issue that has frequently arisen in these cases is, is a lack of any uh, explicit private right of action that would clearly permit an employee to sue an employer for violations of the state's medical marijuana statute. And a number of employers have relied on this to their detriment. This defense was raised by employers and rejected by courts in Rhode Island, Connecticut, Delaware, and Arizona. Thus, almost uniformly, recent decisions reflect that where a state statute contains explicit employment protection, but no enforcement mechanism, courts are likely to find that an, that an implied private right of action exists. Now, finally, these recent decisions reflect that courts are taking an expansive view of statutory employment protections. As noted earlier, the statutory employment protections vary in scope. Several state statutes merely prescribe discrimination based solely on an employee's medical marijuana cardholder status. However, as both, both Nofsinger and Callahan demonstrate, a prohibition against discrimination based solely on cardholder status may equate to a prohibition against discrimination based on actual off-duty use pursuant to that status. In light of these decisions, employers should be wary about relying on a narrow reading of a statute's employment protections to justify adverse action against a medical marijuana licensee for the off-duty use of marijuana. Now, so far, all of these cases that we've discussed have, ar have arisen in states with explicit statutory employment protections. As Bob will now discuss, even in states with no such explicit protections, courts are finding that employment protections may nonetheless exist. Thank you, Lauren. Uh, there are a couple of cases in particular where employment protections were found without any statutory provision for an employment protection, but found implicit in the law and I will, first of all, I want to talk about a case out of Massachusetts from 2017, the Barbuda case, the Advantage Sales and, and Marketing. This case is not only an illustration of a court finding an implied employment protection under a medical marijuana law, it's also a case study in how not to handle a pre-employment drug test. Uh, Christina Barbuda was offered an entry-level position, a non-safety sensitive job uh, offer, with Advantage Sales and Marketing in the late summer of 2014 and accepted the offer. A company representative let, let, left a message for Barbuda as part of the onboarding process, telling her that she would have to take a mandatory drug test. She immediately called her supervisor-to-be and told him that she would test positive because she has Crohn's disease and has a medical license to take marijuana in the evenings for her Crohn's disease. And her supervisor assured her not to worry, I'm sure it won't be an issue. Uh, she then took the requisite pre-employment drug test and she failed. And not only all of that, but they didn't have the results by her start date. So she started and on day one at, with the positive test result in hand, they fired her. Um, the Massachusetts law does not have the kind of explicit protections that, that Lauren talked about in some states. It does indicate just vaguely 
that medical marijuana users shall not lose any right or privilege they otherwise have under the law because they hold a medical marijuana card. And it does say, presumably for the benefit of employers, there was, there's no requirement under the law, quote, for any accommodation of any on-site medical use of marijuana in any place of employment. One thing we're gonna learn is when legislatures say uh, that, that there's no reasonable accommodation requirement for on-site use, that generally is not a good thing for employers because courts take that and say, well, there must be an accommodation obligation for off-duty use, and that's what they did in Barbuda. And the court said that implicit in the medical marijuana law uh, for the state of Massachusetts was that employers need to try and accommodate off-duty use. For and, and accommodation could need to include the interactive process like under the ADA. And it might include things like trying to determine whether the employee can use an equally effective medication besides marijuana. And if that's not possible, then the employer can only take action based upon uh, the use of off-duty use of medical marijuana if they can show prove the defense of undue hardship akin to what we have under the ADA. So we reached that result in Massachusetts without any explicit statutory protection. Courts are looking now to find protections. Early on in the history of medical marijuana, states like Colorado, states like California, states like Washington, found that there was no implicit or other employment protection for medical marijuana users with regard to their employment. As you can see from what Lauren and I are saying, that is changing dramatically. And if and legislatures are including employment protections, and when they're not included, more and more courts are finding them. And nowhere is the, cha is the, is the change in direction better illustrated than in New Jersey. Early on, there were, there were a couple of decisions in New Jersey which seemed to suggest that employees would not have any particular employment protections under the state's uh, medical marijuana law. But in just last month, in March, there was a shift in direction. In Wild v. Carriage Funeral Holdings, the court found that there is a duty to accommodate under the state disability anti-discrimination law, what New Jersey is called the law against discrimination, even though there is no explicit protection for medical marijuana users in the medical marijuana statute itself in New Jersey. So, so what we have is, is if, you, if, if you're trying to decide what to do in a particular state and you look at the state statute and you see, don't see anything that limits your right to take adverse action, based upon off-duty use, you shouldn't assume that you can because states are finding implicit protection. Uh, but bear that in mind in while in Barbudo. You, you, it's not just enough to look at the statute itself. You have to look at case authority. And if you decide to take adverse action in one of these states, even though there's no adverse case authority, you run the risk that you will become the adverse case authority. So this is a very difficult issue. What you need to do is, cons is consider state applicable law, and you really sh should consider, particularly in non-safety sensitive positions, if there's a state medical marijuana law, whether you can accommodate off-duty use. I wanna talk about the scope of how the world is changing. And many of you have heard about Massachusetts, New Jersey, Delaware, and you're thinking, okay, this is one of these liberal Yankee concepts, this medical marijuana. and and, and employment protections are really a, a bi-coastal concept and not something we need to worry about in the same uh, 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 southern plains of the United States. Uh, th that is not the case. Arkansas voters have, have approved medical marijuana in the state legislature in 2017, it, it enacted enabling legislation that provides a variety of complex protections for both employers and employees with regard to medical marijuana use. Also in Oklahoma, as many of you know, despite the state legislature's rejection of the concept of medical marijuana, the voters took a different view and via referendum approved medical marijuana and they approved a referendum that explicitly included broad employment protections. Um, and the business community in, in Oklahoma was, was not happy. 
and they went to their le their very pro business legislature, and they enacted laws uh, in 2019 in March that the bill was signed that provided some protection for employers, at least with regard to safety sensitive jobs that Lauren's gonna discuss with you a little bit. Also, New Mexico has had a medical marijuana law for some time, but it did not have any employment law protections. Well, that changed just days ago on April 4, when the governor of New Mexico signed new legislation providing for strong employment protections that Lauren will discuss briefly. Finally, Louisiana, for those of us in Texas to our east, provides for medical marijuana, though they're still trying to, to construct their program and their law doesn't include any explicit protections and we don't know much about what the law will be like in Louisiana. By the way, some of you may wonder, well, given, given the geography of what you just said to say, Bob, what's gonna happen in Texas? Uh, again, we just have CBD use and only for intractable epilepsy. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick has assured everyone he will not allow any expansion of the concept of medical marijuana in Texas. Let's go to the next slide. And I'm gonna turn things back to Lauren. Now, as Bob mentioned, Arkansas, Oklahoma, and New Mexico's medical marijuana statutes create important and employer-friendly exceptions to their anti-discrimination provisions for employees in safety-sensitive positions. Now, while the specifics of each law varies and should be consulted independently, these exceptions generally permit an employer to terminate or take other adverse action against an employee in a safety sensitive position on the basis of a positive test for marijuana, even when no on the job impairment is suspected. Importantly, safety sensitive is defined differently by each state's law. Arkansas, stat Arkansas statute, for instance, broadly defines safety sensitive to include any positions identified by any federal or state agencies as safety sensitive, along with any other positions designated in writing by an employer as safety sensitive in which a person performing the position while under the influence of marijuana may constitute a threat to health or safety. Oklahoma's statute defines a safety sensitive position as any job that includes duties or tasks that an employer reasonably believes could affect safety and health of the employee or others, and the statute provides a non-exhaustive a non list of specific duties that fall within this category. Finally, New Mexico defines a safety sensitive position as one in which performance by a person under the influence of drugs or alcohol would constitute an immediate or direct threat of injury or death to that person or another. Now on its face, of these three statutes, New Mexico's contains the most restrictive definition of safety sensitive positions. And given these varying standards, careful thought will need to be given before determining that, a, that an employee is exempt from a statute's protections based on the safety sensitive nature of their position. As a general rule, employers should construe these exemptions narrowly. Positions should be analyzed in accordance with the specific statutory definitions, which, as we can see here, varies between the states. Employers should also ensure that those employees deemed to hold safety sensitive positions are on notice that they are subject to removal from their position or termination due to a failed drug test for marijuana. Finally, I do want to note that the Oklahoma and New Mexico laws containing these provisions won't take effect until later this summer, so employers should use this time to update their policies and job descriptions accordingly. So I wanna talk briefly about one of the more difficult issues surrounding marijuana in the workplace. One of the factors that makes marijuana much more complicated than alcohol from the perspective of employers is that unlike tests for alcohol, a positive test for marijuana does not necessarily indicate that an employee is impaired or under the influence of marijuana. This is because THC can trigger a positive test days or weeks after it was ingested. However, the duration of actual impairment is much shorter and depends on a number of factors, including the form of marijuana ingested. Further complicating matters is that there is no current consensus on what the appropriate standard is for determining impairment based on marijuana usage. While the court in Whitmire suggested that expert testimony was required to establish actual impairment, there is still no scientific standard on what amount or level of THC in breath, blood, or saliva 
actually indicates impairment. Similarly, there is no currently scientifically accepted test to reliably determine someone's impairment level due to marijuana. In the face of these challenges, state medical marijuana laws offer little guidance. While most states with explicit employment protections expressly permit employers to take adverse action against employees who are under the influence of or impaired by marijuana in the workplace, most of these same laws fail to provide any definitions of or instructions on how to determine when someone is actually under the influence or impaired by marijuana. Indeed, there are only two laws that currently address this issue. As mentioned, Arkansas's medical marijuana statute contains a broad definition of factors that may be used to determine that someone is under the influence. Similarly, uh, in Illinois, the statute broadly defines the circumstances under which an employer may consider a registered qualifying patient to be impaired. Now, in addition to the lack of statutory guidance, the case law produced to date has not provided any clarity on what an employer may rely on to lawfully determine on-the-job impairment. Whitmire is the only case in which this issue has been directly addressed, and the result was largely unhelpful for employers. Finally, uh, some states, such as Washington and Montana, have defined standards for impairment due to marijuana as it relates to operating a motor vehicle, but these standards have been criticized as arbitrary by some, and there's no indication that these standards that have been established for law enforcement purposes can be relied upon by employers to establish impairment in the workplace. So all of this uncertainty begs the question of what steps an employer can take to support an adverse action based on a belief that a medical marijuana licensee is under the influence of marijuana in the workplace. First, it's critical to properly train supervisors and managers to identify signs of on-the-job marijuana impairment. It may be prudent to bring in outside experts or consultants who can accurately advise management on what signs to look for. Second, it is important to document any observed behavior that gives rise to a belief of on-the-job impairment. Employers must be prepared to articulate specific symptoms and behavior to support, that support a belief of current impairment or influence. Third, an employer should substantiate any suspected impairment with drug testing. As Whitmire suggests, employers may want to consider consultation with a drug testing provider to help establish that the level of marijuana detected in a drug test was at a sufficient quantity to cause current impairment. Although, as noted, there's no scientific consensus on what this quantity actually is. So given the pace of change in this area of law, along with the uncertainty as to what actually constitutes impairment, cautious employers should consult with legal counsel prior to taking adverse action against a protected medical marijuana user based on a belief that he or she was under the influence in the workplace. And Given all of these difficulties in determining whether an employee is actually working under the influence of marijuana, one alternative solution is to simply focus on the underlying conduct or behavioral problems that are observed as a basis for discipline or termination, rather than a belief than on the belief of on-the-job impairment. Now, before we conclude with some final recommendations, I want to talk briefly about CBD. As an initial matter, some of you may be asking, what is CBD and why are we talking about it? CBD is a, is a chemical that's found exclusively in cannabis plants. THC is another chemical that comes from the cannabis plant. However, CBD does not get a user high like THC. Additionally, as Bob mentioned, CBD has been touted to have many health benefits and usages particularly with respect to anxiety disorders, seizure disorders, and pain management. CBD can be derived from hemp or marijuana, both of which are versions of the cannabis plant. The differentiating factor, however, between hemp and marijuana is their levels of THC, with hemp having only very minor levels of THC. Now, CBD oils and edibles have flooded the marketplace in the past year with retailers such as CVS and Walgreens announcing that they will soon carry CBD products. Despite this market activity, 
Confusion still exists about the legality of CBD and, and frankly, with good reason. Now, at the state level, and as mentioned at the beginning of our webinar, a number of states have enacted laws narrowly legalizing the use of low THC CBD for certain medical conditions, including, as Bob mentioned, Texas. Additionally, in those states that have legalized recreational or medical marijuana, CBD would also be considered legal to the same extent as marijuana in those states. Now, at the federal level, after the recent passage of the 2018 Farm Bill in December, low THC CBD oil derived from hemp, which is defined as cannabis plants containing less than 0.3% THC and produced in accordance with the standards set forth in the bill, no longer fall within Schedule 1 of the Federal Controlled Substances Act. As a result, many CBD products on the market are now legal under federal law as long as they fall from the parameters of the 2018 Farm Bill. So where does that leave employers? Unfortunately, there are, are simply no clear answers yet, as state legislatures, state law enforcement, and federal agencies are still struggling with inconsistencies between state law, the 2018 Farm Bill, and other existing federal regulatory schemes. Notably, for employers and employees alike, use of low THC, CBD, the variety legalized federally under the 2018 Farm Bill, is highly unlikely to trigger a positive drug test. This is because drug screening panels are typically designed to detect THC, not CBD. As a result, low THC CBD use in accordance with the 2018 Farm Bill is unlikely to trigger a positive drug test. However, according to Quest Diagnostics, if a CBD product contains THC, at sufficiently high concentration, it is possible, depending on one's usage patterns, that the use of CBD products could cause a positive urine drug test result for marijuana metabolites. Thus, even despite an employee's good intentions, the potential for failed drug tests remains, particularly because the CBD market is not well regulated and, and CBD products frequently contain higher levels of THC than advertised on the bottle. So all of this begs the question of how should an employer respond to, a, to an employee's assertion that his or her THC positive drug test was based upon his or her use of CBD? This is a great question with, with no easy answer, frankly. In many situations, this should not be viewed as a legitimate excuse. However, there are, there are numerous fact-specific variables to consider, including the levels of THC detected in the employee's system, whether the employee asserts that his or her CBD usage is for the treatment of a medical condition, whether it is hemp or marijuana-derived CBD that is at issue, uh, and any applicable state medical marijuana laws, and the legal status of CBD under applicable state law. Accordingly, given all of these factors, we recommend proceeding with a careful analysis of the specific circumstances and state law if the situation arises. And with that, I'm going to turn the presentation back over to Bob for some final thoughts and recommendations for employers moving forward. Thank you, Lauren. I just want to offer a few thoughts about what you may consider uh, doing going forward to cope with these issues. Let me begin by saying, in past years, we hoped that there would be case authority that would assert on preemption grounds and supremacy clause grounds that these state laws do not subject an employer to liability because the employer is simply abiding by the federal prohibition on marijuana. Uh, as Lauren explained to you from the preemption cases, that argument in recent years has not gone well. And I don't think it will be a savior for employers. So you shouldn't assume that you're, because of the Controlled Substances Act, you're, that is an out. And for those of you with federal contracts, you should not assume that the Drug-Free Workplace Act is an out. And for all of us with employees in the workplace, we shouldn't think that the Occupational Safety and Health Act is an out. Some people have argued the General Duty Clause of, of the Occupational Safety and Health Act should be a basis for employers saying, I have to comply with federal law, I'm going to ignore your state employment law protections. The courts have not been receptive to that argument. So you're going to have to wrestle with these state laws. You're not going to get a, a 
federal preemption, get out of jail free card, or at least at this point, it appears that's the case. You need to draft clear policies reflecting your position on drug and alcohol testing. Uh, by the way, most companies I see continue to want to state in their policy that they oppose and, pro and to the extent the law permits, prohibit employee marijuana use, period, off and on the job. And many employers will often say, and I think this is wise, they rem you remind employees in your policy that marijuana remains a illegal under federal law. But you should include some, if you're a multi-state employer and you're not simply having employees, for example, in Texas, and you're in states where there is medical marijuana or recreational marijuana, you want to add a caveat to your policy that recognizes that you will comply with state unique laws with regard to off-duty medical marijuana use. If you don't do that, if you have an absolute ban with no potential exceptions, you are asking for litigation over your policy. You should inform applicants about what your position is on marijuana before they, they, they go for a test. You don't wanna do what happened in the Barbuda situation. You, again, you want to be categor you want to be careful about not including categorical statements like we have forever in drug policies that all positive drug test results for without limitation, for example, result in termination. Because as Lauren pointed out, there are going to be situations where you will, in some states, in some circumstances, where you will probably need to accommodate off-duty marijuana use. And as she pointed out, a positive test for marijuana is not at all synonymous with on-the-job impairment. By the way, in, in crafting your state, in crafting your drug and alcohol policies, don't forget that states like Oklahoma have other requirements for drug policies, about things that need to be included in your policy. Do not forget about state-specific laws on drug policies generally. We now know that as a result of states like New Mexico and, and Oklahoma, you are going to need to, in advance, engage in an analysis of which of your positions are qualifying safety sensitive positions for which you can hold employees accountable even for off-duty medical marijuana use. You don't wait for a dispute to arise, arise to engage in the safety sensitive analysis. You need to engage in that that, that identification process now for your company. Is, as Lauren pointed out, a critical backstop in avoiding litigation is that before you take adverse action against a cardholder for off-duty medical marijuana use in this day and age, you better consult with in-house or outside legal counsel. Because even in states that, again, that don't have explicit protections, a court might find a protection for that employee. This is my advice about CBD. Don't spend time worrying about it. CBT is not an intoxicant. So don't, I, don't t spend your time being concerned about whether your employees are buying CBD products at Walmart. But do you concern yourself, particularly with safety sensitive positions, with marijuana, which remains it is an intoxicant? Let's talk about one broad approach you may, you may want to consider taking. You could do the following. You could bar employee use of marijuana on and off duty unless the employee is a medical marijuana licensee. With respect to medical marijuana license holders, you could completely prohibit marijuana use or impairment during work hours at the workplace and during the performance of work duties. You could impose discipline on employees who test positive for marijuana use unless they are medical marijuana license holders under state law and they use it consistent with that state law. Now the kicker is that in some states, you're gonna to wanna to have a different rule for safety sensitive positions like New Mexico and Oklahoma. But I wanna point out that some states like Massachusetts, like Delaware, have not made any allowances for different treatment of safety sensitive positions. So you should not assume that your safety sensitive de designation and, and it will pass muster in all states. But you'll need it for some states, again, like New Mexico and Oklahoma. 
Finally, you all may wonder, Bob, what's the end game with this? I'm a busy business person. When is this mess going to be resolved? We would think logically the end game is going to be someday there's going to be control of the, of the White House in both houses of Congress by forces who support legalization. And there will be national legalization. And there'll be a question of, of what to do about safety sensitive jobs under that legislation. But what, how any of us feel about what's right or wrong, that almost certainly is the end game. Whether that's two years away or five years away or 10 years away, we don't know. But for the time being, you're gonna have to con you're going to have to cope with these disparate state laws as best you can. I hope we provided you with some good guidance today, and I appreciate everyone joining Lauren and us. Thank you, and have a super day.